How do we celebrate New Year's? By staying up all night long. And we get sparkling cider. Some people stay up till midnight. I fell asleep a lot. What happens at midnight? The ball in New York City drops. Everybody's happy. You celebrate. It's weird when we have to um, K-I-S-S kiss. <laughs> Gross. What are your New Year's resolutions? I have sweets all the time. A back foot. Change my name to Sparkly. Every week, a movie night, a game night, and a Gilligan's Island night. Have lots of time with my grandparents. I would like to try wasabi. I like to get a unicorn and bunnies. What's the thing you want to do most with your life? I want to be an NFL kicker, be the best cellist in the world, and be the best Lego builder in the world. Going to all the continents. A missionary. And when I ride a deer. Pharmaceutical rep. Because that's what my dad does. Have like cool bedroom with like cool posters and a hot tub and a ladder my closet and have like a secret lab. I want to get married to Kian. It would be a pony wedding with lots of ponies and have twin girls, Maddie and Madison. Why is it not good to give up? Then you'll never achieve what you could. Even if you have some rough times, you don't give up. You keep going. Someday you will get it. And don't ever say you can't get it. If you give up, you might be missing out because one day you will get it. And it will be really awesome <laughs> when you do. How can you help someone to not give up? Encouraging them. Giving them advices for stuff. Say, you're doing a good job. Um, I like to hug people and kiss them. And I'll give them a toy. Then I'll say, I'll be your best friend. So, come on. Um, since I can do it, then, I'll, then, then I will teach you how to do it. Why does God change us? Because he loves us. He loves us so much. He knows that we need to be changed sometimes. And he wants us to have a better life. He doesn't want us to be lost. He wants us to come home to Him. How does God change us? Puts all the good things in our hearts. He changes us by giving us something to believe in. Why is it important to give someone a second chance? When you're giving someone a second chance, you're trusting them and believing in them. So that we're like not caught up on something that we've done and we can't really move on. To have a new beginning. What would you tell someone who didn't believe God could change them? That Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And He can change you because He's Jesus. Keep praying and He will change you. You will feel it. Because you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Happy New Year! Happy New Year, everybody. Happy New Year. Good morning. Happy New Year, or soon to be New Year, or as we say where I come from, Feliz Año Nuevo, or Prospero Año Nuevo. Can you say that with me? Prospero Año Nuevo. You all sound terrible. Okay. <laughs> Good enough. I like to think of the kids, I like to think of kids in general as, quote, cute sinners. Okay? That's the best phrase that I can think for them. They speak from the heart. And they don't have much arrogance or rancor. Have you noticed that? They'll just pretty much tell you what they're, they're thinking. This video made me think of the passage in Matthew 21, where we read that after Jesus' tri triumphant entry into Jerusalem on a donkey, he first cleansed the, the temple, he healed the blind and he healed the lame, and then the children who were at the temple began to cry out, saying, Hosanna to the son of David eliciting a negative response from the chief priests and the scribes. But Jesus obviously delighted in the children and quoted from Psalm 8 when he said, Out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies you have prepared praise. How true that is. Oh, speaking of young people, a student, um, I get my student evaluations. If you don't know me, I, I teach part-time. I'm a retired 
professor from UNM, but I teach an algebra course, usually in the fall semester. I just got my evaluations in, and there's a part where they write stuff. One of them said, this guy is like the Cuban George Carlin, okay? <laughs> I have no idea who that was, you know, but... It's almost as good as Calvin Cuban, isn't it? No, I'll stick with, I'll stick with that, that other one. Okay, now, would you please stand with me? And what I would like to uh, do at this time is I'd like to read our passage uh, for this morning from Romans uh, 6, 1 through 4, and then please remain standing for our prayer. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can, how can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him in baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you that you shed your grace on us and that by your grace alone, and through no effort on our part, you regenerated us from the dead into life by the power of the Holy Spirit, inspiring us to repent of our sins, believe the gospel, and be saved and united with Christ for all time. His blood cleanses us from all sin. His resurrection is our resurrection one day. We pray that we do not take your grace lightly or cheaply, but knowing that your grace costs you the death of your Son, we strive all the more to walk in newness of life. These things we pray in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. So walking in newness of life today in 2020 and infinity and beyond is the main theme of my message this morning. And since newness of life necessitates new resolutions, I am pleased to announce we have a big treat for you. I have invited the Reverend Jonathan Edwards from the 18th century to come up here and give us his own resolutions for life. Reverend? I thank you, reverends, for those kind words. And I am humbled, as I am sure you are, to present me to your congregation today to impart my wisdom in my 70 resolutions, not 69, 70 resolutions. But I do have one request of you, Reverend. Yes? That next time you summon me, that you present a more suitable vessel, one that hath hair on the head and not on the chin. I'll take that under advisement. Have you ever heard of Rogaine? <laughs> who, who is Rogaine, no, Mr. No, no, no. Go on, go on. I would prefer to have the head warm not the chin, but I suppose I should thank Providence that I do not appear as one of your abominable troll dolls. <laughs> anyway, oh, and one more thing, Reverend. Yes? It has been a year hence since you last invited me to this place. You have had an entire year to build up and work on your flock and they are still a rough-looking lot. It's not my problem. That's Pastor Dan's problem. His evaluations are coming up, so we'll, we'll deal with them then. Perhaps it is they have an inner beauty. <clears throat> Being sensible that I am unable to do anything without God's help, I do humbly entreat him by his grace to enable me to keep these resolutions so far as they are agreeable to his will for Christ's sake. Resolved that every man should live to the glory of God. Resolved that whether others do this or not, I will. That's Res Luther. Excuse me, Reverend? That's Luther. It, the first it, it two, those not, are Luther's it, resolutions. Yes, they are. I read it on Google. Google is never wrong. Wert thou ever a pillar tutor at Yale? Perhaps thou hast had thy sermons printed, lauded, and read throughout the land? Didst thou publish 
a faithful narrative of the amazing work of God in the conversion of several hundred souls in Northampton, or perhaps important discourses on various important subjects with five, five of thine most important sermons and the impact upon the Great Awakening. Or perhaps thou didst print. What did thou print? <laughs> the justice of God and the damnation of sinners? No, no, but I'm Cuban, and unless you want me to have an episode, you should get back to your script. Quill? Quill? What hath thou done to thy quill, man? Didst thou chew off the feather? Ink. <laughs> Change wording of first two resolutions. Resolved that I will do whatsoever I think to be the most to God's glory and my own good, profit, and pleasure in the whole of my duration, without any consideration of the time, whether now or never, so many myriads of ages hence, resolved to do whatever I think to be my duty and most for the good and advantage of mankind in general. Resolved to do this, whatever difficulties I meet with, how many and how great soever. Resolved to be continually endeavoring to find out some new invention and contrivance to promote the aforementioned things. Resolved to if, if ever I shall fall and grow dull so as to neglect to keep any part of these resolutions, to repent of all I can remember when I come to myself again. Resolved never to do any manner of thing whether in soul or body, less or more, but that what tends to the glory of God, nor be, nor suffer it, if I can avoid it. Resolved, never to lose one moment of time, but improve it most profitable way I possibly can. Resolved. Okay, 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 that'll do, that'll do, that'll do. We're, see, unlike you folks back in the 18th century, in the 21st century, we have very short attention spans, okay? <laughs> Like, it's like a goldfish, you know, similar to that. Reverend, wouldst thou not summon me here to no. this place to impart my Psycholo wisdom upon this congregation? Psychologists Which, blame these things. Wouldst okay? thou impart to start things. the study of the Acts of the Apostles and then not continue on to Romans? Well, maybe you would. Thank you, Reverend, for sharing your part of the resolutions of the faith. Now, can you just... Go back? I has come up with the 71st resolution. Quill? Resolved, ignore any future summons by a Reverend Garcia. You want to go now. Thank you, Phil. Thank you very much. Phil is up here once in a while telling us something about Jonathan Edwards, something or other. So um, since we're on the subject of resolutions, let's now take, we're going to take a look this morning at four life resolutions. Two of them are from Martin Luther and two of them from Jonathan Edwards. By the way, the ones he recited were, one, were his actual resolutions, which he made in 1722 at the age of 19. How many 19-year-olds do you hear talk like that? Okay, he was an incredible, precocious child, but very, very intelligent, way, way ahead of his time. Not only ahead of his age, but ahead, very much ahead, ahead of his own time. There are also the fill-in-the-blanks in your bulletin. I'm not the least bit offended if you don't fill them in there. I believe that these apply today just as much as they did in the 16th and 18th century. But before we go there, I want to say a couple of things about just good old resolutions. And here's the reason why 80% of people who make a resolution to lose weight give up on that resolution by February. And there you have it. I mean, you know, it just makes no sense at all. See, it's, it's those donuts. And I keep, if you, if you read my blogs in the past or, or read me on Facebook, they're made by the devil, okay? He wants to screw up humanity, and this is how he does that. So anyway, that's why resolutions fail. But it is true. 
80% of the resolutions, New Year's resolutions that we make are broken by February. By next New Year, a full 92% of resolutions are broken. That means that only 8% of resolution makers actually make the resolutions effective and they affect them uh, profitably for the rest of their lives. Now you're probably thinking, wait a minute, we came in here to hear an encouraging message and you're calling all of us screw-ups in here. We're not going to make it. Why even bother with making resolutions? You know, perhaps we're making the wrong kinds of resolutions or the kind of resolutions I want to focus on this morning are spiritual resolutions. So let's begin, okay, with uh, Luther and Edward's life resolutions. I'll begin with uh, Luther's resolutions. Uh, Edward's er uh, earlier erroneously claimed the first two resolutions he gave was his own. But let's not be too hard on them. You know, they didn't have Google back then, so he couldn't check it out. So from Martin Luther. Now, as far as I've been able to research, these are Luther's uh, only two resolutions, or perhaps they are the main two. Again, if I sound funny, if you weren't here earlier, I have a really bad chest cold and it's affecting my speech. Normally, I'm very, very loud and very, very fast and very, very obnoxious, and this is humbling me a little bit. So please bear with me. We'll hope the electronics makes up for, for the difference. Okay, so these are excellent spiritual resolution. And the first one, which Edwards mistakenly said, was this, resolved that every man should live to the glory of God. You know, back in Luther's and Edwards' time, living to the glory of God, you heard that a lot. They spoke about that, that a lot. It was a Christian's first and foremost aim in life. That was their big goal. But what does this mean? So here's two passages from Scripture that I want to share with you that I believe shed some light on this. The first one is from John 15, 8, and it says this, By this is my Father, glory by this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Prove to be my disciples. My Father is glorified as we bear. Being a disciple of Christ, all Christians, by the way, are disciples of Christ. Uh, it's a glory to God in and of itself. Bearing fruit is a metaphor for being good, excuse me, for doing good from the heart, by grace, through faith. It is evidence of being a disciple of Christ. The other passage is from Matthew, Matthew's Gospel. And it goes like this. It says, you are, this is from the Sermon of the Mount, and it says, you are the salt of the earth, you are the light of the world. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. This passage uses salt and light as metaphors for good works. The other one you talks about bearing good fruit. This one talks about salt and light. Salt does two things which is why Jesus used it as a metaphor here. First of all, it flavors and it preserves. Salt used to be a very high commodity. I know if you are aware of this, but the word salary is based on the Roman word, on the Latin word for salt. Sometimes Roman soldiers and other publicans were paid in salt because it was used not only to flavor food, but it was used as a preservative. They didn't have refrigerators, so that's what they used. They salted the, the, the meat, and it would last a lot longer. It, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't rot. And the, uh, my point here is that salt both flavors and preserves, and the church is the only agency on earth that can say this. This is from Psalm 8, 34, 8. Taste and see that the Lord is good. We are here on earth to tell others, you know, welcome. You know, I have Christ in my life, and here's the difference he's made in me. I want you to taste and see that the Lord is good. And only the church can preserve goodness in the world. Light exposes the truth. It makes evil run into the, into the shadows. In general, these are two ways that we publicly do good in the name of Christ and to the glory of God. The other of, of uh, Luther's resolution is simply this. It says, resolve that whether others do this or not, I will. Whether others do this or not, I will. In other words, once Luther discovered that salvation and justification before a holy God is by grace alone, through faith alone, according to Scripture alone, in Christ alone, and all for the glory of God alone. Those are the five solas. Uh, sola means alone of the Reformation. This was the, cry, the, the, the rallying cry of the Reformation. That he determined that the only one he needed to please was God, and that pleasing him was a glory to him. And for a while in there, 
uh, around the time he nailed the 95 Thesis to the door of the uh, Castle Church in Wittenberg in uh, October 31st, 1517, he was pretty much the only guy that was getting it. He was very, very much alone. Imagine. So when he says, resolve that whether others or not do this, I will, he's not just saying, he, he's not just talking. Okay, he's not just talking. He really was alone. Imagine that the entire, that the entire, one of the biggest organizations at that time was the church, and the church is after you, and they want to burn you alive. And if they don't get you, the entire Holy Roman Empire, okay, the political and the militant, uh, military wing of the, whole, of, the, uh, of the church is after you as well. And those who do agree with you aren't coming out in public with you because they're afraid of what might happen. So when Luther says that whether others do this or not, I will, he wasn't just talking, okay? It wasn't just, yeah, yeah, I'll do it anyway. No, he really, he really, uh, he really lived that. Now, when I think of this, I'm reminded of this passage in John's gospel. When Peter saw him, John, he said to, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, If it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me, Mark 8, 34 and 35. Prior to this, Jesus told, uh, uh, Jesus told Peter, Feed my sheep. When you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wh wh wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hand and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. In other words, and I'm paraphrasing here, what Jesus is telling him, you, Peter, are going to die a martyr's death. And as far as we know, that's what happened. He was crucified. Legend says he was crucified upside down. We don't know if that's the case or not. But we do know that that's what the Romans did to non-Roman citizens. He was, he was crucified. And what about John? John lived to a ripe old age and died in his bed. Okay, so, so he's telling him here, he, Peter is saying, how come I don't get to, to be like him? He gets to live to an old age, and you're telling me I'm going to die a martyr's death. And Jesus is saying, don't, don't, don't be concerned with that. Don't be concerned with what I hand you in this life. You just follow me. You just, you just follow me. Now, let's go on to two of, of uh, Edwards' resolution. This one here, he was 1722. He was 19 years old. He was living in New Haven, Connecticut at the time. He was still a teenager when he wrote the first 20 or so. And then after that, he wrote him the next year, the last 50. He wrote about 50, más o menos. And uh, that's when he was about 20 years old. And uh, his, res his first resolution was this, resolved, that I will do whatsoever I think to the most, to God's glory and to my own good profit and pleasure. This was one of the first life resolutions. Again, as you heard him declare earlier, he goes on to say after this, in the whole of my duration, without any consideration of the time, whether now or never, so many myriads of ages hence. The two things he mentions here are to be a glory of God, which we already talked about, and also he's saying that it is spiritually profitable and a tremendous pleasure to him personally to be able to live to the glory of God, which I would just said, it is to do good works in the name of Christ. It, he, he, he considered those things to be a pleasure. Now, where did he get that from? Well, being that he grew up a Puritan, and, uh, and they, they had catechism, and the catechism that the Puritans used was the catechism that the Puritans wrote. And that was the uh, Westminster Shorter Catechism. And uh, I don't know how he arrived at this resolution. More than likely, it was in this way. And more than likely, he got it from the first question in the Westminster, uh, in the Westminster uh, Shorter Catechism. And the first question is this. What is the chief end of man? In other words, what is the primary purpose for which God created humanity? And the answer to that is this. Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. And these, uh, these Puritans who put this together in 1648, so it was like almost 100 years before Ed Edwards, they wanted to put verses on there to justify how they came up with these answers. In 1 Corinthians 10.31, we read that whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. See, when I say things like that, you're probably thinking, you know, you, you don't understand. I'm a very busy person. I don't have time to go to a, you know, to work at a soup kitchen. Who's asking you to work at a, that would be great if you do that. I don't have time to this. I'm poor. I cannot give it. Look, 
It is a glory to God, in my opinion, if you change your child's diaper. Okay? Because you are doing the will of God. And the reason you're doing the will of God, somebody has to change the child's diaper, right? It is, it is, a, it is a glory to God, even the very things that you might consider mundane in your house. It is a glory to God. You may be sick. You may not be able to do much. Anything that you do, anything that you do for, with a good heart, you're doing it for the glory of God. So don't beat yourself up if you're not out there doing this, that, the other, evangelizing and all that kind of stuff. Just do what you do with pleasure and do it all for God. In Philippians 4.4, 4, we are instructed that we should, quote, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. You, you don't understand I'm in pain. You don't understand my husband just left me. You don't understand we lost our job. You don't understand we're poor. You don't understand I, 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 I can understand some, especially some of the things that I've been through. Rejoicing doesn't mean you put on a false smile and you go around acting like nothing is wrong. But rejoicing means that in your inner spirit, you know that God is in control of all things and that he will bring about a good end to whatever it is you find yourself in. And some people see that good end before they die. And some die and never get to see it. But God will accomplish, it, will accomplish His purposes in your life. And in that, we can rejoice. All else we think, feel, and result to do must flow from these two things. Edward's second resolution okay, is actually number 66 out of 70. He actually came up with 70 resolutions, which uh, Edwards here wanted to sit up here. He'd still be talking. No, I had to get him to sit down, okay? So I'm going to tell you number 66. Say, why are you jumping over to number 66? What about three, four, five, and, and all of that? Because I think that this one is very practical and very apropos to the times that we live in, especially given our divisions in the church. Would you say there are divisions in the church? Okay, if you don't, you've you either been orbiting Pluto, okay, and you just came down to earth today, okay, and you haven't saw anything. There are divisions in the church. Are there divisions in government? <laughs> Even worse, okay? We are divided big time. We are really divided. So I think that this one is apropos. Not to mention that we're having a presidential, uh, a presidential election coming up as well as a congressional election coming up in November 2020. It's only 11 months away. I expect the divisions to get even worse. So from Jonathan Edwards in 1723, when he was 20 years old, he resolved that I will endeavor always to keep a benign aspect and air of acting and speaking in all places and in all companies, except that it should so happen that duty requires otherwise. You know, this guy thought through this stuff, okay? He really, he, he's not just writing these things down. And as far as we know, he actually kept these resolutions his whole life, okay? He actually kept them. He died at the age of 55 from a botch, uh, from a, uh, a botch smallpox vaccination. What happened back then is that they, 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 uh, they noticed that if you cut yourself, and you happen to touch the postule, you know, the oozing uh, from a smallpox person, that sometimes, sometimes that got you a little bit sick, but not very sick. And so what they started doing was they started grabbing people who were very sick, almost to the point of death. They put them in the back of an ox cart, and they go around from house to house. They bring in people in the house. They would take them in, and they would cut right here, and they would grab the uh, ooze, the postule, and rub it on here, okay? And that that would actually, it actually worked, because it was giving him a weakened virus, okay? And it actually worked. In his case, the guy they got it from was a little bit fresh, okay? So, so he wasn't quite, he, they should have gotten somebody that was further along, and so he actually, um, he, he died. He was the uh, president of uh, Princeton College at the time that, at the time that, that he, he passed away. So anyway, uh, it's an incredible guy. So this resolution here reminds me of this passage from Colossians. And it's this. It says, walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt. There's a salt metaphor again. Okay, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Ah, oh, gee, that takes all the fun out of arguing, doesn't it? Okay? I mean, I have to be gracious. I have to be nice. I have to be civil. I can't just yell. Okay? That's the environment I grew up in. 
We recently celebrated Christmas, okay? And uh, we, uh, where I come from, we don't, Christmas is the day that you just hang around and do nothing, okay? Then you, the, the good news is you don't have to go back to school until January 7th. Because January 6th is the day we get our toys. What about Santa Claus? I had some Yankee, Yankee guy, fat Yankee guy. Don't worry about him, you know. And our toys were delivered on January 6th, the Feast of the Epiphany, and they were delivered by the three wise men, okay? Now you say, well, that's stupid. Well, it's more biblical than Santa Claus, okay? At least they're mentioned in the Bible. Where's Santa Claus in the Bible? He's not. Okay, so anyway. And you say, well, did they come down a chimney? No, 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 no. Who's got a chimney in a tropical country? Okay, so what, what the way it worked is uh, we lived in an apartment, and the three wise men would come up the steps with their camels, and they would come right up to the door, and then magically they would shrink down to about that big, crawl under the door, rematerialize, drop off all the toys. Those camels can hold, hold a lot of stuff. Okay, more than some stupid reindeer, and uh, what do you call it? Uh, the sleigh he rides around and right drop off all the toys back down to go out the door next house and they repeat this all over cuba mexico argentina all over the place okay they don't come around here because you don't believe in them okay if you did you would have even more toys seriously seriously that's kind of the way we and one of the finest if you could call the finest one of the finest memories that i have was of Noche Buena, which literally means the good night. It's, it's what we celebrate on the 24th. And uh, we would go to my uh, aunt's house, my, uh, my, uh, my mother's sister, and we would celebrate there. And they were celebrating by eating a pig. When I say eating a pig, I mean the whole pig, okay? We, uh, we, me and all my cousins, we were little. We would fight over the tail. The tail is real chewy. You know, it's real good to eat. Well, it was cooked, okay? Stop making faces at me. Okay. Yeah, it's real, it's real. So we would fight over the tail, and then there would be black beans. There would be rice, and there would be flan and all kinds, all kinds of other stuff. And after, and after the dinner was over, the women would go in the kitchen to clean up. You say, what, a bunch of shoving? Yeah, that's the way it was back then. Okay, got to get over it. Things have changed the way it was, and they would gossip. The men would go into the living room and they would start to argue about Cuban politics. Now, while all this was going on, there's this bearded guy up in the hills in the eastern part of the country making headways towards Havana. And some of my relatives thought it was the best thing. And, uh, the, the best thing. Others were, were in favor of the current government and they would start arguing. None of that stuff you read there did they do. They didn't walk in with them, okay, towards outsiders or insiders, okay? They didn't make the best use of the time. Their, their speech was hardly gracious, okay? Seasoned with salt, seasoned with battery acid maybe, okay? <laughs> Going on and on, okay? And they would argue and argue. I don't remember anybody hitting anybody, but there was a lot of this going on, you know, where you just punch and punch, faces this close to each other. You can see the spit going back and forth, you know, as they yelled, and, and you're a horrible person, and, and, and your mother was a horrible person, which is a big offense in Latin America, telling somebody their mother's a horrible person. And I mean, I'm surprised, and then the whole way home, I had to listen to my father complain about all my relatives. I still had a good time, okay? <laughs> Believe it or not, I still had a good time. Well, none of these people that I can remember were what I would call believers, okay? So they didn't act that way. But this, this right here, you read right there, is what is expected of us. You see, there's a salt metaphor again. Flavor and preserve. Flavor and preserve. Speak in such a way that you sound tasty. Now, what does that mean? People want to listen to you. You engage them. They want to hear what you have, what you have to say. Flavoring, preserving the world in the name of Christ flows from the Father's grace. It is both an act of faith and an act of obedience, and it's always a glory to God. The rancor and rhetoric that I hear so often from both believers and unbelievers alike, from the left and the right, from the blue and the red, from the donkey and the elephant, and everything in between may make us feel good about ourselves and our causes. You see, I'm right. Recently, I was reading this article, and somebody was saying, you know, instead of planting flags, can we just sit at a table? You see the difference? The flag says, this is my side. I'm right, because this is my flag. And you're wrong, because you got the wrong flag. The table, you sit down and say, look, I got my own opinions. I don't agree with you, you know, necessarily. But can we talk? Can we talk? 
in my opinion, that will get us a lot further in the church than it would if we just continue sitting at the table instead of planting flags. If such things don't grieve the Holy Spirit, Isaiah 6, 3, 63, 10 and uh, Ephesians 4.30, then I don't know what does. Okay, so I want to take everything that I've said this morning and condense it into one slide. Okay, so you can walk out of here and say, what did that guy say? He talked and talked something about eating a pork pig, a pig tail, and, you know, you, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, let, let's, let's summarize right here. So I want to summarize the new life resolutions. First, resolve. By the way, the band, would you please come back up? The band or whoever is... Oh, we've got a whole bunch of different people. Here, come on up and get ready and... Resolve too. I've summarized what Luther and Edward said and par paraphrased them into contemporary English. First, to be a glory to God, make the gospel tasty. Now, don't say I want to make the gospel relevant. That doesn't make any sense. The gospel is already relevant. Okay? And at the great white judgment, people who didn't believe the gospel, believe me, they're going to know it was relevant. And you're going to know it's relevant too. Don't try and make the, the gospel relevant it's like trying to make water wet. But we can make it tasty in the sense that we can make it palatable. We can, make it, we can try to do our best to make it acceptable to as many people as possible. Okay? Shed light on the truth. Do good in your family, your church, your world. Be, be salt and light in so doing. Be a glory to God. Second, be it. By it, I mean be a glory to God in the communion of saints, but solo if need be. Best to do God's work with others in the church. When you run into opposition or half-hearted resolves, then you may need to fly solo. But before you go off on your own, make sure that you have talked to as many people. Believe me, I have some idea of how that is. I'm not going to give you the details because I have to maintain confidentiality. But I have been in both in the church and, and uh, when I was uh, an administrator at the University of New Mexico, I've run into situations like that where I'm the only one that is speaking the obvious, okay? And I am literally catching Hades for it, okay? So I understand. Sometimes you just have to push on. But try to do it first within a group of people. As you be it, a glory to God, and do it, enjoy Jesus, enjoy His Word, enjoy praying, enjoy fellowship with the saints. And if you don't already enjoy these things, look, if you're like me, prayer is a chore, right? I mean, just be honest. You'd rather be doing anything but praying. But you know you should, so you go ahead and pray. Or getting in the Word. You'd rather be doing anything else, okay? I mean, there's, there's the, on this screen, I got the Word. On this screen, I got Facebook. Let's see, which one will I choose? Okay, I, I understand that. I understand all, all of that. But what I'm saying to you, if you already enjoy these things, that's great. If not, pray that God would grant you enjoyment in these things and proceed regardless of whether you're enjoying it or not in faith. Believe it or not, if you obey in faith because you know it's the right thing and then you obey, in time your feelings catch up. Some people say that feelings are things to be ignored. Okay, have you tried ignoring you? What are you, Mr. Spock? Okay, it doesn't work that way. You can't ignore your feelings. They're going to come up and grab you and take you wherever they want to. You have to bring your feelings into conformity with the Word of God. Feelings can change, but it may take time. Now, some things, you know, I feel like doing. I feel like eating. I feel like doing this. I'll just sit down and eat and, and do it. The things that I don't feel like doing it, I have to know, is this the right thing? Therefore, I need to obey in faith. Go on again. In time, the feelings, the feelings catch up with you, okay? And if they don't, keep praying. You see, the next and the last one here is prayer and the word are like hot chili. I wrote on here. Why did I write that? Prayer. Oh, yeah, because it's an acquired taste, okay? <laughs> it's an acquired taste. It is. It is really an acquired taste. You see, um, when was it, Hope, that we came in vacation? We were living in Lubbock, and we came in vacation to Santa Fe. What year was that? Pardon? 87. And we came to Santa Fe. We took a vacation. We, this is in BC days, before kids. BK days, before children, okay? So we were ha ha having a great time. It was just the two of us. And uh, so we came to Santa Fe, and I, I went to a restaurant to eat. Goodness gracious, and I'm thinking to myself, why do these people put plutonium in their food? You know? <laughs> What is going on here? This is crazy. You can't enjoy this, you know? 
But then once I moved to New Mexico, I can't get enough chili. You know, I can't get enough. And you got these people that eat and eat and eat this stuff. One time I had a, I had a garden and uh, I decided to grow some habaneros. They're about this big, kind of orange. They're very, very hot. And the reason I grew them was because there was this uh, two people at UNM Valencia who said to me, I eat, I eat chili, like any kind of chili. I said, okay. So I planted the plants. So this, it took a while before. And when they were nice and ripe, I brought a home. I wasn't going to touch those things. You know, I had these special gloves they use at Los Alamos, you know. And, and I brought them over there, and I said, okay, show me. This lady ate one of them. I thought she was going to die. <laughs> Immediately, sweat, you know, her composure. She goes down a bit. You know, I could see she is in pain. Well, it's not so bad. Yeah, it is. You're dying, lady. Tell me the truth. But then this other guy just ate them like M&Ms. No changes in skin color. No changes in facial expression. Okay, tell me who in here is like that. You can eat those things. One, yeah, well, you, you got the gift. I don't. But seriously, because so many New Mexicans like that stuff, I had to conclude it's an acquired taste, right? And how did you acquire it? The minute you were a baby, they shoved that things in your mouth, right? Here, 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 kid, eat this. I don't like eat it. Okay, eat it. And after a while, I said, well, this is actually good. Same thing with prayer and the Word. You just do it. You just do it. You just do it. Don't wait until you feel like it. You'll never do it. Okay? And in time and in time, the feelings will come along. Finally, walk in wisdom. Be gracious in word and deed. Remember that the world is watching how we love. Okay, you, I hope you understand what I'm saying. I'll try to spell it out for you. Remember what Jesus said in John 13, 35. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Wow, think about that for a minute. There is the Great Commission, right? Go into all the world and bring the gospel everywhere. There is the Great Commandment, love the Lord your God. This, command, this, this one here is generally known as the great apologetic. By apologetic, I mean evidence of the truth of the Christian life. This is how people know that we are Christians. This is how they are drawn into the church. So if you, if you instead, you mix in the rancor and the rhetoric and all that kind of stuff, what are they going to think? They're just a bunch of hate, haters and all this, and they're not going to listen. They're not going to listen to our message. You see, beyond our theology and our stance on social issues, it's our love for each other that we are being judged by. And I don't know if you caught on to this or not, but it sounds an awful lot to me when I read that verse, by this will all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another, that Jesus went to the world and said, I give you the authority to judge my people. That's what it sounds like to me. Maybe it doesn't sound that way to you.